My name is Dr. Mark Matar and I'm a gastroenterologist here at Messar Georgetown University Hospital. I mainly see patients with inflammatory bowel disease, which is Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, but also see patients for screening for colon cancer disease um, and also who have the disease itself. Patients with inflammatory bowel disease, we definitely are seeing more and more of them. Last year, there was about 1.4 million people with inflammatory bowel disease in the U.S. Now we're seeing up to 1.6 million people, so it seems to be every year it keeps increasing. We see these diseases a lot in young individuals. They can be diagnosed as early, even as young um, in pediatrics, or even in the 20s and 30s, most common, the patients are diagnosed with these problems. Um, but we also see another group in the 50s and 60s. So we do see a good group of people, young professionals that come through here, college students even, with a lot of these symptoms. So it tends to be pretty common. Our goal is to first diagnose and see what the problem is, and at that point come up with a good treatment plan based on either endoscopy, colonoscopy, or imaging, or lab work. Patients diagnosed with inflammatory bowel disease, we are able to get them back to normal life, usually with the right medications, lifestyle, diet, th these kinds of things, usually um, about 50 to 60 percent of the time. I do try to take a holistic approach um, to patient care, so we do try to get patients, if they need, to even um, be evaluated by psychiatry, if that's the, the case, um, have exercise, um, as a piece of that, also nutrition, we haven't seen nutritionists when, when applicable. So, and we do try to also integrate probiotics or that kind of thing um, where there may be of assistance. I think it's great seeing patients with a specific problem and being able to treat them and have them come back from sort of a miserable um, life with the symptoms of the colitis or the Crohn's and have them actually jump back and being able to be a part of society again and have um, being able to participate in, in their families and just have their, their life back. Inflammatory bowel disease, or IBD, is a chronic inflammatory process which is immune regulated in the bowel, anywhere from, and it can affect anywhere from mouth to anus. So you have Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, those are the two main types of inflammatory bowel diseases. And the main symptoms of those include abdominal pain, blood in the stool, sometimes patients can have fatigue or sort of non-specific symptoms, or even younger patients can have sort of a fail, failure to thrive picture. So inflammatory bowel disease is sort of an umbrella term for Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. There are some patients also have something called indeterminate colitis. So these are diseases that are immune regulate, regulated in the bowel. Crohn's disease can affect anywhere, anywhere from mouth to anus along the small intestine or colon versus ulcerative colitis could only affect the colon or the last part of the bowel. Crohn's disease can affect um, the wall of the bowel and go beyond the wall of the bowel versus ulcerative colitis is more of a superficial inflammation and doesn't cause a lot of the potential complications that Crohn's disease can, such as fistula or abnormal connection from the bowel to other loops of bowel or other infectious pockets or called abscess. And, the, and uh, otherwise, Crohn's disease can also cause narrowing or strictures in the bowel. The ulcerative colitis usually does not. The treatment for both of them are very similar. Most of the things that we know about in terms of etiology of Crohn's and colitis are related to either genetics. So about 20 to 30 percent of patients will have a family member with, um, with inflammatory bowel disease, but most of the patients do not have um, that genetic predisposition. So there potentially is a factor in the diet, especially sort of westernized, industrialized area with preservatives and things like that that can potentially increase risk for Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. So there may be some modified risk factors, but for the most part it is very hard to try to prevent. So in patients with mild Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, we usually start with an oral anti-inflammatory medication. But when patients progress to more moderate to severe disease or have complications from the disease, then we, pro then we progress to medications called biologic agents, which can be immunosuppressant somewhat, and that helps with the immune response that's abnormal in these patients with Crohn's and colitis.
In patients with ulcerative colitis, this has been looked at more closely than in Crohn's disease. So we know that some probiotics or adding good bacteria back into your diet in a capsule form or through a powder can be beneficial in helping with this. The main one is called VSL number three, and that has been shown to decrease the signs and symptoms of mild ulcerative colitis. We also know that the diet may be a factor, so increasing omega-3 types of fatty acids can be beneficial versus some omega-6 fatty acids, which is seen in some, some of the cooking oils that we use. So we try to avoid some of those oils. So because the inflammatory process does affect the whole body, other things like exercise or appropriate nutrition can be beneficial in these patients with Crohn's or colitis. So we do recommend regular exercise, just like we would with most other chronic diseases, regular exercise and good dietary sort of nutrition balance. So some of our patients do require surgery either an ulcerative colitis to have the colon removed. That's one option, but other patients just for really refractory or really um, disease that is not responding to medications, they may need other surgeries to remove parts of their bowel. And we work closely with our colorectal surgeons for these specific types of sur surgeries. At times, we're trying to avoid surgery or patients have already had surgery and sort of need another type of medications, we do have clinical trials available so we can try newer medications on these patients that have maybe better side effect profiles than our current medications or maybe are more efficacious. The way the fecal transplant works is pretty much taking healthy stool that has the healthy bacteria from an individual without the disease and instilling it to another individual with the disease. And for some reason, the healthy bacteria kind of takes over and helps with the current infection. Patients really are very excited when they have this done successfully because they have had this disease, the C. difficile infection for up to, I've had patients even up to one to two years that has been tried with antibiotics after antibiotics, and sometimes patients need surgery for these to, to remove the colon so, um, for the C. difficile. So patients are very relieved and excited and surprised that this simple technique actually works. The data for FMT and in inflammatory bowel disease is so, not so clear yet. There's probably about 18 studies that have been performed so far internationally, mainly in ulcerative colitis, but some in Crohn's disease. And the data there still shows some improvement of symptoms with, with continuous stool transplants, usually via, usually via an enema, but these symptoms do not continue on into remission. And a lot of times the colonoscopy does not show improvement in these patients. So there's still more that needs to be studied with FMT in terms of ulcerative colitis and Crohn's. So we see patients who have C. difficile infection that causes copious amounts of diarrhea. Patients can't live their normal life. They come in, have this procedure done what's called fecal transplant. With that, we get a stool sample from a, from a company just to assure safety, and we deposit that sample into the beginning of the, of the colon using a sedated colonoscopy, and then we come back out. And even by that evening, some patients of mine have felt better with formed stools that they have not had for months before, and then we recheck again for C. diff and it's cured. So there is a website called openbiome.org that does have all the practitioners that are performing FMT nationally. And we are performing it here at Metzard Georgia University Hospital and are able to see new patients with this at any moment. So FMT for C. diff is only indicated when patients have what's called recurrent or refractory C. difficile, which means they've had the disease, they tried antibiotics, usually like vancomycin or metronidazole, 
didn't get better, it tried another course of antibiotics, so two courses of antibiotics. If the C. diff is still there, the diarrhea is still there, then you need to um, see me or have a consultation for FMD. So that takes us back to the microbiome and the bacterial makeup of the gut system. And we know that the, many patients have C. diff bacteria sitting in their gut, not causing any problems. But once you start antibiotics for any other reason, for sinusitis or bronchitis or what have you, then it sort of unmasks the C. difficile bacteria by, by removing or killing off the, the potentially healthy bacteria also. So once the C. diff is unmasked, that's when it could cause more diarrhea. And we don't use the same antibiotics that we would use for, say, sinusitis, but it's a specific antibiotic that's targeted towards the C. difficile that actually takes care of that infection. So patients who, are, who do not have any symptoms over the age 50 or patients 45 years or older who are African-American should be screened for colon, for colon cancer. There are other individuals who have higher risk, some genetic um, problems or patients with inflammatory bowel disease do need earlier screening. So that would be the patients who have increased risk for colon cancer, just such like Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, whenever they have involvement of more of their colon with inflammation. Otherwise, some patients have genetic predispositions to colon cancer, or they have family history of colon cancer in a young individual. So patients with a family history of colon cancer and someone, say, with a parent with colon cancer, at age, say, they have the colon cancer at age 50, then you would have the screening of that child at age 40, so 10 years before the parents or the relative had the colon cancer themselves or at age 40, whichever comes first. So that is a um, problem that we are seeing a little bit more common than we used to see in the past. Colon cancer used to be a disease sort of older patients over 50 or 65 or so, but we are seeing some more younger patients with this. It's hard to say what the reason is, but possibly related to diet. We know the high fat, high preservatives in the diet, high red meat consumption may increase the risk for colon cancer, and we know the obesity rates in the U.S. is escalating. So that is one factor, but at the same time we know there's some young individuals who are very healthy and otherwise fit and eat the right things that still succumb to colon cancer. So patients who have any blood in the stool that's not improved with topical agents for say hemorrhoids, patients with iron deficiency anemia or low blood count that's not getting any better, or abdominal pain that um, seems to not be improved, especially lower abdominal pain needs to be evaluated regardless of their age. And we are seeing more young patients with these symptoms. So even if you're 20 years old and you have these symptoms, I would take it seriously. So just like anything else in medicine, if you feel like your symptoms are being dismissed, I would consider a second opinion. So for example, if you have blood in the stool, not quite getting better and the doctors aren't necessarily taking it that seriously, I would consider either asking them to refer you to a gastroenterologist or see if you can get a second opinion to be further evaluated. So a lot of times we think about colon cancer as a disease for older patients, and that usually is the case, but young patients do still get the symptoms like blood in the stool and, or change of bowel habits or that kind of thing that we do need to take more seriously. So in those instances, we do need to be persistent with our physicians to make sure we get the appropriate referrals for colon, colonoscopy or colon cancer evaluation, and also to evaluate for other things like Crohn's and colitis, other things that could be going on that don't just go away with time or topical therapies.